Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. I am coming to you during my uh, tour of low-income accommodations here in the UK, places that are about as expensive as your average econo lodge and still are really, really awesome. This is a flat on the top floor of a very, very old building. Uh, somebody as old as me and out of shape as me and wasn't great climbing up those stairs many times, but still um, an amazing place at a ridiculous good price. Like I say, Motel 6, Econo Lodge, it's about the same when it comes right down to it. This is a great time to visit Britain. Okay, so a lot of you have tuned in uh, and maybe thinking that this is all clickbait. Don't blame you for thinking that. I want to make one thing perfectly clear. Starship is a more important project, definitely. Expanding out into the solar system, that's what's going on at Boca Chica. That, of course, is what makes it important. But there are many things about Saxavord that make it a bigger operation in terms of geographic site, in terms of location, in terms of numbers of approved launches through the government. Include including launch providers, I could go on and on. Now, if you haven't tuned into part one of my tour of this facility, please do, because I know not very many of you have. That's linked right here and also in the description. Be good to check that one out just to put everything that I'm about to say into context. But I'm about to prove to you that what's happening in Saxavord is going to result in more launches per year, at least for the next couple of years then Boca Chica is going to be carrying out and certainly a lot of other activities that Boca Chica isn't even doing at their facility. So let's get right into it right now. I'm going to be talking about the differences between the two spaceports over the course of the entire video. But first of all, we need to talk about geography. The distance between here and here is almost two kilometers. And this includes the locations of three of the five launch pads. I think all five of them are going to be located on this peninsula in the long run, plus the satellite integration facilities and other assembly buildings. Now, by way of comparison, Boca Chica the launch pads and the tank farm would fit into an area about this size. Now, of course, there's also the huge vehicle assembly buildings with Boca Chica. And once again, I'm making it very clear that the rockets are much bigger, what they're building is much bigger. And indeed, the launch providers are actually going to be building the rockets in their own countries before they bring them out here. But this peninsula is not the full extent of everything they're doing here. There's a hell of a lot more. This location here is going to be the location of Launchpad Elizabeth. And by the way, it's nearly complete. What you're looking at right now is what used to exist in the area. All of these are former RAF buildings and RAF bunkers, some of them dating back to the time of World War II. And this is one of the many advantages that this location offered to Frank Strang, the investor in this property, when he got started in the first place. He himself has retired RAF. RAF, and this entire area is a former RAF base, complete with residential quarters. I actually stayed in a lieutenant's quarters while I was there, and yeah, it's a very, very big facility with lots of employees, almost a hundred right now, and there's going to be many, many more once launches actually get started. This facility will be capable of launching rockets within the next four to five months. It's just the launch providers themselves that may hold things up, but engine testing is going to be taking place here soon as well. So before I get too far into this, let's go ahead and rejoin the tour. 
Okay, so also I want to give you just an impression of the scale of this place. I mean, you guys are familiar with Boca Chica, where the uh, you know assembly buildings are for Starbase and all that, and how far separated they are. It's really not that different here, and you need this kind of separation when you're rock launching rockets from one place and then you're integrating satellites someplace else. So you have things way at the end here, and then if you look at the scale going back the other direction. As you can see, this place is colossal. Walk me through the process of what a launch provider is going to be doing when, let's say, okay, I want to launch a rocket from Saxaford. My rocket, let's say it's high impulse, for example. I mean, I'm told they preload their rockets. They have the solid fuel already on board, that sort of thing. So it kind of takes that process out of there with their hybrid engine. But, um, you know, what do they, what are the steps that a launch provider needs to go through to get their rocket out here, get it operational, that sort of thing? Well, Take it even further back, actually. Sure. Probably six months prior, we need to start uh, getting licenses for like for marine licenses, which is drop zones. So we need to start that process well, well before. But we would expect them to uh, be coming to us about four to five weeks prior to launch, coming up in uh, standard 40-foot containers. The beauty of our location here, as you found out in coming yeah. up, is the connectivity and the supply chain. So they can come on the overnight ferry and then just drive up here They'll arrive on our site, go to our integration hangar, and then for a great deal of time, it's going to look like nothing's happening because they're going to be working away in the integration hangar. Maybe three weeks before launch, we expect the uh, spacecraft to come up, again, into the integration hangar and then into the uh, clean room to be prepared. And then about a week before, we would then expect the rockets to start to come out onto the pad and we start to do all of the pre-launch uh, preparations. All of this is ongoing, all of the range equipment is being uh, prepared, so the tracking telemetry and the flight termination systems are being tested all the way up to the day. We'll keep a close eye on the weather, because I think, as you know, the weather here changes yeah. very, very quickly. Yeah. Uh, if you don't like the weather, just wait, it'll change. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll be constantly looking at the weather as we get closer to the launch windows and then predicting when we're going to actually launch. Last question, um, in regards to the satellite integration and the involvement of local talent and local technicians and all this, I'm sure every launch provider is going to have their own technicians and all that, but Spaceport Cornwall, you know, kind of saw to it that, you know, a lot of local technicians could be engaged in the integration process with Virgin Orbit as well. Do you foresee that some of these launch providers may allow for that as well to have maybe folks from Scotland, Shetland, etc., to be involved in the integration process here? Abs absolutely. We always wanted to run this as an airport. And if you go to the airport, British Airways don't refuel their aircraft. They don't do or any of the uh, passport control, etc., etc. It's done by third parties. Uh, and we always wanted to go to that as a business model. Initially, we expected the companies to bring all of their own people to do the fueling, etc., etc. And we thought maybe after two years, they would say, well, what you could do this for us, and then we don't have to bring as many people. Astra is a great example of that. They want to take a minimum amount of people to the spaceport. Interestingly, we're already in Farnborough, where we met, people were coming up and saying, could you do this for us? Could you do the fueling for us? So, yes, it's moving much, much quicker than we ever thought. Uh, uh, we're still trying to work out how we do that, but absolutely, and that's really where the, a huge amount of the benefit to the local yeah. population. Absolutely, because the obvious you know ramifications of that are more local people involved, more jobs, and then with more people coming here all the time, obviously more need for you know, hotels, local business, restaurants, everything, right? Exactly. I mean, it should make the economy flourish here. It, it, uh, absolutely, although we can't guarantee for our uh, cousins across the water you have a Burger King and a McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> I think most of it would be disappointed, actually, if well, we yeah, had one yeah. of those here. <laughs> not, to, not saying any of us would want to try haggis, but yeah. you know. <laughs> anything else you want the viewers to know real quick before, before I, you have to go? I, I just think, follow us uh, in social media, uh, uh, on YouTube, because it's happening here in Saxaford. We are building launch pads. We're going to be launching next year, and it's really, really exciting. So please follow us, support us. Talk to you know politicians, industry. Come to Saxaford. 
the number one uh, spaceport for Europe. And having been here for a couple of days now and seen just the scope of this of this uh, organization and just how big this facility is and what they're building up here, and you guys got to see that in the previous video, I can attest to everything that's happening here. It's very impressive. Thanks so much for your time. Pleasure. This is the northernmost beach in all of Britain. It's located very close to the Arctic Circle. In fact, it's practically right on it. It is one of the most movingly beautiful places that I've ever been to, and it's located just off of the Saxavord facility, which means in the future, people are going to be able to watch rocket launches from this idyllic location. And believe it or not, the vast majority of the locals that I talk to are really not upset about this because COVID took a terrible toll on this island, its tourist facilities, its business businesses and now there's less than a thousand people here. So the prospect of all these launch providers and not only that, all of these new jobs people who are going to have to be fueling up the rockets to other types of technicians, to integration personnel, all sorts of local talent that's going to be needed in order to provide a more comprehensive experience to the customers. And this is going to make the population of this facility explode. And we're not talking about years in the future anymore. These launch pads are practically complete and will be capable of handling rocket launches as I said, within the next couple of months. And not only that, engine testing is going to be taking at one of the old RAF airfields located nearby. And that is a whole different animal, a whole different type of service that this facility can offer that Boca Chica does not offer. And those engine tests, by the way, are beginning within the next few weeks. So where I'm standing right now, this is due north behind me, and this is launch pad. Elizabeth is right back here. As you can see, there's a lot of work going on here. A lot of the pad work is going to be completed by November. So they are really working at top speed to be ready for you know an extensive launch cadence in 2023. So as all of you know, polar orbits are ideal when you can launch them as far north as possible, number one. Number two, you have open ocean there in case there's any problems, anomalies, etc. And then, you know, of course, having an ice-free port, having circumstances, yeah, it may be windy here, but really they can launch in conditions that are 50 knots or even maybe a little bit higher than that. So even though the wind may seem to be a problem here, most of the time it really isn't. So I'll tell you, for this location, you couldn't ask for anything more perfect perfect uh, for polar launches. So once again, on the other side of the hill, huge amounts of wind here right now. Launch pad Elizabeth uh, directly behind me. But once again, to give you an impression of the sheer scale and scope of what's going on back here, you can see the entrance to the facility all the way back there. Places that they're going to be doing satellite integration, three different buildings for that simply because they have so many launch providers coming in here. And then of course uh, we have launch pad Fredo. Remind me again, Robin, the other one. Callum, so launch pad Callum as well. And that's three to start. We're gonna have five and maybe six in the next few years with a huge launch cadence of a minimum of 30 rockets per year. Crazy stuff. And by the way, in case you're wondering who these ABL guys are, well, they're a division of Lockheed Martin. Their first launch is scheduled to take place 
this month from Alaska. However, their first launch from Saxavord is scheduled for the first quarter of 2023. No, not sometime in 2023 or at the end of 2023, the first quarter of 2023. And if you check their payload user's guide, you will see that Saxavord is the only location that is suited for high inclination and polar orbits. The rest are for mid to high inclination so that's a bit lower as far as latitude is concerned. Therefore, Saxavord is the ideal location for this launch provider to send payloads of up to one metric ton to a 500 kilometer sun synchronous orbit or 320 kilograms all the way out to geosynchronous transfer orbit. In other words, this company is capable of sending payloads equal to what Rocket Lab can send to low Earth orbit all the way out to GTO. And like Firefly, they're gonna disrupt the entire industry. And as I've always said, I'm not trying to slam on Rocket Lab here. They are adapting to the new environment of competition, but still, companies like this are gonna change everything, and they're gonna change it from Saxavord. All right, so here we are. We're at the last phase in our interview process. Really wanted to get an opportunity to interview somebody who's on the front lines of the operations day to day in the trenches right here in Shetland. Sir, would you be so kind as to in, uh, introduce yourself to the viewers? I'm Steve Carter. I'm the domestic site manager for UK Spaceport in the Hunts. Well, so how many years have you been working here? Oh, uh, probably about 10, 10, yeah, nine and a half, 10 years, 10 years at the moment. Um, starting from uh, as a resort rather than a spaceport, um, a Saxport resort and hostel and uh, self catering units. So, you, 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 we've spoken before, and, and you used to live in the London area. So, what compelled you to come here to what's essentially the back of beyond, um, you know, to live here and, and work here in this kind of environment? Uh, um, long story, really. Um, I left uh, sort of the south of uh, uh, England uh, to move up to Inverness uh, with an ex partner. And um, unfortunately, for our sins, it didn't really work out that well. And uh, uh, Frank and Debbie. Um, suggested I come up to Shetland and uh, try working at um, uh, Saxe Award Resort. I came up for Frank as a chef um, and then uh, escalated from being chef to taking on to a franchise and the restaurant and then after that uh, becoming re-employed under um, Saxe Award and uh, took on the site manager's role over the last seven years. So I've noticed something about the culture. You, you, uh, you folks have been uh, generous enough and, and nice enough to invite me to dinner on a couple of nights now as you guys all have dinner together in, in, uh, in kind of in a common room and such. And it's also really neat to see that the, the, the CEO of the organization is eating in the same room with all the guys who've been working in the field. Tell me a little bit about that culture and, and what's involved with it. I think, I, I think that it's important that um, we can... We can, we can relax with every single member of uh, the team and it's really important that they see from the CEO, uh, CEO down to um, uh, the domestic staff on, on site being able to mix and there's no barriers between us and uh, rather than working as a team we're actually quite a big family and that's what's um, uh, our, our strong points is that we all know each other inside and out and if there are any issues at work, then they're dealt with very quickly. It's not uh, a case of corporate law and things like that. We, we talk to each other and we communicate really well. And that's, that's the basis of any, any good business, I think. If you've got that communication with your staff, then they'll work for you and they'll do anything that they possibly can. And, and um, I think that shows in business. And if you've got that family, family ties and that family environment, then... Of course, that's going to happen all the time.
Okay, so we're finally out of the wind, I'll tell you, but I, I, I will trade, wouldn't trade anything from that experience. So incredibly beautiful. But another thing that I'd really want to emphasize is just how comprehensive the services that they have here, that they offer. I mean, to the, to the workers, about 80 people here. Um, you know, you have a commissary facility here. Everybody comes here to eat in the evening. And it's not just the workers either. I mean, you have the people who run this facility, the people, the executives, everybody eats together here. Here. It's a really amazing environment. Laundry services, everything is provided here because of the isolation of the place. You pretty much need to have those kinds of services. And once again, this was an, an old brewery at one point. This, this building is obviously old and it dates back to the 60s as part of an RAF base um, that, that once existed here. And you'll be seeing a little bit more of that here in a minute. So yeah, what? a place just cavernous so many of these uh raf buildings are now being made use of and they have play music here you know they have conferences and other events um as you can see just so many you know places for people to set up eat enjoy themselves etc just to make people feel at home because once again this isn't kind of a facility where you know you go to work and then you know, commute back to your home in the suburbs. This is all very, very isolated, very comprehensive. And so, you know, it's, it's just a community unto itself on an island that has less than a thousand people total on this entire island. It's, it's not populous since the RAF left this area. The population has dropped off, but Obviously, this, uh, this organization is bringing huge change to this area by bringing so many jobs and bringing you know, so much opportunity to Onst and to Shetland. And, uh, and obviously, they're preparing not only for what's happening right now, but also for the future. And as you can see, just from all the posters everywhere, space, they never forget that space is what's bringing all this opportunity to these isolated islands in the United Kingdom. And as you may have noticed during this tour of the facility, I have also been taking you on a tour of the various launch providers that are going to be flying out of here. We've talked about Astra, we've talked about ABL, and we've talked about High Impulse, and we also need to talk briefly about Skyrora, the only homegrown launch provider that's going to be taking off out of here. They aren't carrying the kind of payloads that ABL is going to be carrying, but still about 300 kilograms up to low Earth orbit and also a unique type of fuel they're going to be using called Ecoscene, which operates off of recycled plastics. And on top of that, they also have a space tug or kick stage. That's something that ABL doesn't have actually to carry out secondary missions, including space debris removal. And we have new launch providers coming in all the time to look at the facility. As a matter of fact, another one, and I can't tell you who they are or even what country they're from, but they were there negotiating while I was visiting the facility. There is such an enormous amount of interest in this location because not only of its latitude, but also of the wide variety of services it has to offer from satellite integration to engine testing to fueling services, so many things, which is why I feel this spaceport is a larger operation in many ways than what Boca Chica has. And speaking Speaking of Skyrora, there are big events coming with them soon, which I also can't talk about yet. But this is the reason that I chose to spend 23 hours on six different ferry rides to get all the way up here to cover this unique place and the enormous scope of what they have planned and indeed what they're going to be executing next year and not late next year, but at the beginning of next year. I'm so incredibly excited and grateful for the opportunity to come out here and I'm not done yet. We still have one final episode for me to conclude my final interview and also my reflections on the various aspects of this enormous journey that I undertook to cover this unique aspect of private space flight. So in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. Please hit that like, please hit that subscribe, and as always, stay angry about space!